Hi there and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. This week we've got a powerful story to tell about how native plants frame our connection to the earth we treasure right in our own backyards. We've also got a few ideas about how to use natives to replace the plants that just aren't working for you. Right now, let's see how the Kyles are making a difference one bird at a time. When Paul and George Ann Kyle moved to Austin from Houston in the 70s, they never realized how much their lives would change. They never imagined that they'd own eight acres on the Balcones Canyon land to eventually donate to the Travis Audubon Society. Now their Keitura Canyon, named for the chimney Swiss they safeguard, is part of a 15-acre bird sanctuary and nature preserve managed by them, Travis Audubon, and the Driftwood Wildlife Association. We stepped foot on the property and fell in love with it. They wanted $70 down for uh, three lots, and uh, we didn't have $70. So our friends loaned us, loaned us $35, and we put the money together we were able to purchase the property. Novice carpenters, they built their house into the hill, initially without electricity. We built the foundation with hand tools. By the time we got the foundation built, it was pure and beam. Uh, we found enough money to buy a small generator, and that gave us a capability of running a, a skill saw, which helped a lot, kind of sped things up quite a bit. The canyon gave them a new perspective on gardening. Well, when we first, we first moved here from Houston, we wanted to plant things that we grew up with in Houston, you know, elephant ears and banana trees and things like that. But uh, fortunately, they all died out, and the only things that lived were the native plants. They weren't bird experts either. Birds discovered us while we were constructing our home. Wrens and woodpeckers would come into the unfinished rooms and, and hunt for insects or just try to find a little place for their own bedrooms. And they captured our imagination, and we began studying and trying to identify the different species. And as we learned more, we discovered that the native species really need the native plants because they've all evolved together. And there are many species of plants that can be uh, naturalized that are somewhat beneficial, but none of them are as, as helpful to the wildlife as the native indigenous species. And we discovered that just by leaving things alone and just plugging in a few natives, the birds, the wildlife came in and actually brought other plants that were native to the area and their droppings. And so now we have quite a wonderful little uh, variety of, of native plants that help all different species of wildlife. One thing that helped was fencing a small portion against deer and opening up the canopies of ash junipers to encourage understory trees. And once we fenced the deer out, uh, we noticed that a lot of things started to grow up in the understory that weren't there before. Paul put his juniper trimmings to good use. He also used them in his gentle trail building. The slope of the property, the topography, is at such an angle, too, there's very few actual level spots. So what Paul would do is take a, a big tooth rake and rocks, uh, rake some of the rocks down into little short walls which would catch the water and the runoff whenever it rained and build soil up behind the small piles of rocks. Originally he used mortar on all of the rock walls and we found out that using just a dry stack method allowed other wildlife like the, uh, the snakes and the lizards and the wrens to hunt inside the little crevasses and it also, when it rains, allowed the water to run out instead of building up behind the walls. They corralled the hillside's runoff into watering holes for wildlife. Serene observation points are essential. To gather small groups at monthly events, they built a classroom. To feed themselves, Georgian and Paul built a shelter for their organic crops. But to attract essential pollinators, plants beyond the screens guarantee support. These days, the Mustang grapes are devoted to wildlife that dine on them or nest in their thick screen. 
They only use feeders near the house for a deck and inside view of the birds that get primary nutrition from the canyon. Along with 30 species of birds that nest at Keitora, it's become a stopping ground for migratory species. Endangered chimney swifts have become a special passion. This kind of leads to the name of the, the place, Keitora Canyon. Uh, chimney swifts, the scientific name is Keitora pelagica. They migrate to uh, Peru in the fall. They're here during the, early, during the spring. They show up in early March, early to late March, raise their babies, and then by October, mid-October, they're gone. Uh, chimney swifts, like all of our neotropical migrants, are declining, uh, so much so that they, they're listed as a threatened species now in Canada, uh, where their populations are down by more than 95%. Here in the lower United, in the United States, uh, populations are, are going down. They're not as dramatic as that, but we probably have half the chimney swifts that we had in 1960. Their concern led to two books to educate others to join their preservation mission. The Kyles built 16 towers to encourage nesting at Keitora. Three of the towers that we have do have monitors, cameras in them, where we can, we can monitor the swifts. Uh, we've been able to, one reason we've been able to learn so much about them is because of this technology with these miniature cameras where we're able to observe them without disturbing them. To preserve the preserve they've created, in 2006, they made a big decision. We signed over the house, the land, uh, basically everything we own to Travis Altman. And it'll be maintained uh, in perpetuity as a bird sanctuary. And we have events out here once a month uh, uh, during most of the year where people can come out. It's very limited because we, it's a preserve, it's not a park. We want to allow access, we want to let people come out and see what's here and, and learn what they can from what we've learned. Uh, but we also don't want to interfere with the wildlife that we've actually done all this for. This planet is more than just humans, and there needs to be a little more concern and thought to other species that share this world with us. And it's becoming more and more difficult for just about every species, humans included, and it needs to be more of an all-inclusive mentality. And indeed, uh, Planting just one native plant in your yard or setting up one seed feeder or a peanut butter log for the woodpeckers or maybe just a bowl of water for the warblers or not spraying your oak tree in the spring when you see the little bungee jumpers fall because those little bungee jumpers are warbler food and the warblers migrate from South America and most of them go all the way up to Canada to breed and they eat only insects and if everything is poisoned between their wintering grounds and their breeding grounds they'll disappear and many of them have so it's real important just for everybody just to take one little step and maybe not squash that bug that you're not real sure what it is or maybe let that garter snake just go around the corner because he doesn't want to be any closer to you than you want to be to him it's, it, it's just little steps and I think everybody can do one little thing to make the planet a better place. Now that's a truly inspiring space and what great people, what a gift to the rest of us they're creating there in their wildlife sanctuary in the hills. I'd like to give a special thanks to musician Robert Skiles for composing the music that went with that piece to capture the spirit of the Kyle's gift to us all and our wildlife. He just happens to be neighbors of those folks. So uh, thanks, Robert. Now we're going to turn our attention to Native Plant Week, appropriately after that piece. And we're going to be talking about some all-star Texas natives. And I'm joined by Alice Nance, who is the Conservation Program Coordinator for the City of Austin's Parks and Recreation Department. Good to see you again. Nice to see you. Yeah, great to have you here. And uh, Native Plant Week, obviously a celebration of the great uh, flora of uh, Central Texas. And as we just learned, it's absolutely essential for our wildlife to have the plants that they evolved with present here in, central, in the region. That's absolutely right, and it's wonderful that the state of Texas passed a bill to create Texas Native Plant Week, which is, will always be the third full week in October. Mm -hmm. So this year we're celebrating it October 18th through the 24th. Okay. 
So it's a, it's a great time to celebrate the native plants and just happens to be wildflower seeding time. So I think there might be something to do with that. That's always a nice kind of thing to do at this time of year. Absolutely. And there's lots of wonderful things that we can do during Texas Native Plant Week. Mm -hmm. We can all plant a native tree. We can plant a garden for butterflies oh, right. and for wildlife habitat. We can volunteer mm -hmm. at a Native Plant Week event. Mm -hmm. um, also visit demonstration gardens of native plants to learn more about species that might work well yeah. in your area. Right, and uh, speaking of doing things in an appropriate time of year, uh, October is the best time of year to plant trees and woody shrubs, So, we're, and we have a few on our list, so we're going to be talking about that. Yes, that's exactly why we have Texas Native Plant Week in October, because it okay. really is the most ideal time for planting. Yeah, so let's go ahead and, and talk about some of the, the ones that are for uh, specific to our region of the state that are all-star natives. And one is the evergreen sumac. And uh, this is a plant that I, when I think of a good native alternative to a lot of those plants that were brought in from other places like uh, the, especially the dreaded ligustrum Absolutely. plant. This is one that really fills that need in our garden of a, of a big evergreen plant. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful screening hedge as well. Mm -hmm. And it provides evergreen cover for wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, the berries are spectacular for mm -hmm. birds and mammals. Um, and, you know, more importantly, I already mentioned that it's evergreen, but that's really important, um, you know, in the winter when we don't have a lot of evergreen interest. Yeah, I, I like it too because of the glossy nature of the foliage. It, it's a, you know, it is a, a lustrous looking plant and one that uh, it gets quite large, it kind of spreads around. If you have the room for a large plant, this is a, a really good choice. And we can't forget the fall color. It's That's one right. of our few yeah. um, trees, small shrubs with um, fall color, which is mm -hmm. really wonderful to have here in Central Texas. Yeah, it turns a bronzy color, which is really lovely. So that's mm -hmm. the evergreen sumac, mm -hmm. which is a great plant for us uh, and grows in the hills or grows in clay. It's a really well adapted plant. Mm -hmm. um, well, another plant on the list, and I have to admit this is one of my all-time favorites, is Texas persimmon. Uh, and I love it primarily for the beautiful bark of the established trees, but it has all sorts of, of beneficial uh, attributes. Right, and what I like about it as well is the bark mm -hmm. because it very closely resembles the crepe myrtle. Mm -hmm. So this is a wonderful native um, alternative to the crepe myrtle, which mm -hmm. is used quite frequently in our area. So having right. something that has a similar branching structure and similar um, bark mm -hmm. is, is really nice. And, um, you know, the little... Uh, persimmons right. that it produces are eaten by all kinds of songbirds and um, wildlife. all kinds of squirrels and all kinds of wildlife. Possums so, and you name it, love those yeah, little it's fruits. It's definitely a good wildlife uh, mm -hmm. tree and it just adds a nice sort of structure in the garden I think as yeah. well. I am crazy about it and, I, and one of the things I use this plant a lot for is bonsai. Or, or containerized mm -hmm. plants because it has that uh, the classic form that you don't really need to work with a whole lot mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it has a, a really kind of a Japanese look if you just a little bit of light pruning on it mm -hmm. is I think just a terrific plant and very xeric too which is another nice thing about it. Yeah, and all these plants are which is why you know we've chosen yeah. them they are they are native and another cool thing about the Texas persimmon is that it does produce flowers mm -hmm. in the spring which provide nectar for butterflies but then it's also the larval host plant of the Henry's elfin butterfly oh, and the gray cool. hair streak as well. Didn't so, know that. Yeah. Cool. Larval host plant. Okay. Um, my, it, we're, you're hitting a lot of my favorite plants here on this list. My favorite oak tree for Texas is the lacy oak. This is one from the western part of the hill country. A, a smaller tree but really beautiful. I, it has a lot of special qualities to it. Mm -hmm. One of which is that it's oak wilt resistant more so yes. than some of our other oak species. Mm -hmm. But also it has it seems it doesn't just have fall color, but it has I guess in the spring it yeah. has really nice peachy mm -hmm. um, leaves. The new growth comes mm -hmm. out kind of orangey red, yeah. Mm -hmm. And any oak that we can plant is going to be great food for wildlife. Mm -hmm. The acorns, of course, mm -hmm. are the source of the food there. But the uh, fall color, and then the, the during the summertime, the leaves have that slight bluish cast as mm -hmm. opposed to the dark green. 
uh, which makes it stand out, and is the one of its common names is blue oak. So mm -hmm. that's uh, 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 another tip off that the, the, of the, about the plant color. Right, and it's also one of the smaller oaks, so it's mm -hmm. not going to be real dominating in the urban landscape. So it's right. good for small urban yards like we have in right in the Austin area. Well, I love the lacy oak, and I'm glad to see so many more of them being planted around mm -hmm. town. Uh, the coral honeysuckle is yes. a favorite hummingbird plant. Yes, it's one of my favorite plants. Yeah. So yes, it's known for being a hummingbird attractor. Um, it also produces berries that mm -hmm. birds, songbirds, will eat as I well. I forget about the berries. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, they also um, are relished by songbirds. But you know, it's a, a semi evergreen vine. Mm -hmm. So depending on kind of your microclimate and your yard, you might have leaves persist in the winter, which mm -hmm. is nice. And it's not real aggressive, so it no. can handle you know climbing up a deck balcony or mm -hmm. you know on a trellis or something of that nature. Yeah, a lot of vines get out of hand. This is one that doesn't. Mm -hmm. This is an easy to control vine. And it can also be used as a ground cover. Mm -hmm. So it can be a climbing vine or it can be used as a ground cover as well. Oh, I've never thought of using it as a ground yeah. cover. Yeah. Interesting. I guess if you sheared it a little bit, that would help. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, the flowers are the real show here and they, they are wonderful. They are and I mean they're perfectly made for the hummingbird. Yeah, yeah, you can see that long tubular structure, mm -hmm. you know it was made for a hummingbird's uh, beak. And the color as well is, <laughs> yeah, is also right. key. Um, and you'll get more flowers if you, you know, have it in, mm -hmm. in sun. So. Real briefly, we have just enough time to talk about the tropical sage, okay. which is a great plant for the shade. Yes, shade mm. or sun, which mm -hmm. is nice. Yeah. It's versatile. Yeah. It also can be used as a ground cover. Mm -hmm. Reseeds readily, so something to watch out for. But seed eating birds like finches absolutely mm -hmm. love it. And then, of course, hummingbirds and butterflies um, will flock to it. Yeah. So. It, it, great color. It comes in a variety of colors now white, peach, yeah. reds. And this is one that I have seen people shear or actually mow mm -hmm. and let it regrow after it kind of gets faded out a little bit. And it, it performs spectacularly that way and it makes a good ground cover in mm -hmm. uh, shade or light shade. Mm -hmm. So uh, tropical sage or salvia coccinea is the botanical name on and that It's one. also somewhat deer resistant because the yeah, pungent. A little, a little bit. Bug, <laughs> a little bit. Nothing is deer, deer proof. But. Right, right. Well, these are all plants that people should be considering right now. Alice, thank you so much for coming uh, on Central Texas You're Gardener. You're welcome. It's, it's my a pleasure. Real ple it's a pleasure to celebrate uh, Native Plant Week with you. So thanks again for being here. Coming up next, it's our friend Daphne. Hello and welcome to Down to Earth. Our question this week is about some palm fronds that are turning brown. Thanks to our viewer, Ben, who sent this photo in to us. He first noticed this problem as a small brown spot on one of the fronds. The plant was outside and the temperatures were getting over 100 degrees. The plant was also in a very small container when it was first purchased and it was still in this container outdoors. Ben brought the plant in and transferred it to a larger pot and several things may be going on here. The first problem definitely may have been some heat stress and some sunburn from those high temperatures so bringing it indoors was a good thing to do. But once you get the plant indoors, there is a lack of sun. You also transferred the plant to a larger pot, and so when, since you brought it indoors, it's not getting much sun, definitely there's some overwatering going on here. And the type of browning that we see in these photos do indicate that there, the plant is getting a little too much water. So when you move a plant indoors, you need to cut very far back on the water and then move it back outdoors as soon as the environment is right. Our plant this week is Damianita, Chrysactinia mexicana. It is an evergreen, low mounding subshrub. And subshrub is one of those interesting little terms that we use for a plant that's kind of shrubby and woody, but it doesn't get very big. This beautiful little plant has vibrant yellow flowers and a deep forest green aromatic foliage. It does grow very low to the ground, so if you do wish to smell this plant, it is best after a rain. Maybe you could cut pieces of it and bring it indoors. It does get about 12 inches tall and up to 2 feet wide. Those flowers are going to make that plant a little bit taller. It does get a little straggly in the extreme heat, so you can shear it back if you want to. It's native to West Texas and normally is found on south-facing rocky slopes. So again, this is another one that's great in our decomposed granite landscapes that more people are putting in. 
It looks great in little pockets, especially near larger rocks if you have those in your landscape. It loves full sun, can take a little bit of shade, and natural rainfall only. But if we're getting really hot, as we often do in August, you do need to give this plant a little bit of supplemental water. It's also hardy to zero degrees in addition to taking all of our heat, so it makes it a great choice for us. If you put this in the ground, don't amend the soil with any organic matter. It does like really well-drained soil. To do in your garden this week, it's time to plant annual flowers that flower in the spring. It's a great time for those. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org ctg to send us your question or a plant of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with John Drongle for Backyard Basics. Hello, gardening friends. Welcome to Backyard Basics. Well, vegetable growing is as big as ever. I've never seen so many people going out and growing vegetables. A lot of good reasons for that, food quality. You're not going to find um, better quality, better taste, freshness than the produce that you grow in your own backyard. But not everybody has a backyard. And uh, sometimes uh, light is limited. And so we look for alternatives. People are living in condos these days, you know. So there isn't a whole lot of place to grow vegetables, maybe on your roof. But if you don't have any of those things, then this right here is called an earth box. This is one of the container gardens, it's been around a few years actually, that you can grow a lot of vegetables or herbs in. Now there's several components to this. If you overwater it by mistake, just for example, there's a hole right here, and I thought I'd show you that now before I cover it up. And um, any water that gets to be too high in there, flows out. It's an easy one. And also, um, if you're going to move it around, there's some casters on it. These little casters go on the bottom of it, make it easy to move around once it's uh, filled or got stuff growing in it and the light's moving. Then, this goes on the bottom. This right here is the way that we keep the soil out of the water. So, this goes on nice and snug in there, but it's a few inches above the bottom. So, the plants or the soil isn't really sitting there. Although, we will add some some soil to the sides to help siphon it up. Now one of the other things is you water from above. And so you take this watering tube and stick it in that hole right there, it goes all the way down, that's where you put your water in. And so that makes it easy. One of the other things is you need a good potting soil. And so I mix this one up myself. This is some compost and uh, some perlite and a little bit of vermiculite and a product called core fiber. Now this is the husk from the coconuts and it's a, a peat moss replacement. I like it a whole lot. It's a very sustainable product. and so. So um, this is a real nice light mix. And that's what goes into the corners first so that the water is siphoned up into the growing medium. And that's what makes this so darn neat. It's easy to water. It's a limited space and it can go in front of a window. Um, and you can grow some fantastic tomatoes in here in the summertime too. You can grow bell peppers, cucumbers. There's a frame that goes on the back of this thing and um, this will support many of those plants in this small space. So that's really neat. When you put your soil in there, the uh, product comes with a little bit of dolomite and this is a source of uh, calcium and magnesium. And and then you will put in the soil in the middle uh, about three cups of an organic fertilizer. And then you've got it set up. It's ready to grow. And so um, one of the things that we do once the soil is in there very nice is to put this little cap on there. This little cap goes from edge to edge. And in the cap, what we'll do is we'll cut some little squares. That keeps it from evaporating too quickly. And then we put the plants in those little squares. For example, in the cool months, we might grow some cabbage. Well, we'll be able to put six big old cabbage in here. I mean, this is a nice container to grow that much cabbage. So you'll have three across the front and three across the back, and we'll grow some nice cabbage in there. You can also grow lettuce in there. About six lettuce plants would go into this and um, fill out those heads very nicely. You'll have fresh lettuce outside all the time. So that's another thing that you can grow in this real intensive style. So even if you have limited space, you're going to be able to grow a whole lot of vegetables in there. And um, spinach, that's another one that can go into this thing. And when you're growing spinach in here, you can put 10 plants in there. Of course, you know that spinach cooks down rather easily, so you need a whole bunch of them. So you would put 10 plants of spinach in this thing. Uh, I think that's a really nice, intense way of doing it. You can mix it with other
other vegetables. I would put herbs in there too if you've got all the vegetables you need, but you don't have enough herbs. An assortment of herbs, oregano and thyme, and this is sorrel. I really like the lemony flavor of sorrel. Makes a great sorrel soup, and it's a very pretty plant. So an assortment of herbs, it would be uh, just right for in here, maybe your cilantro in the cooler months. This is a good place to grow it. So the earth box, a nice little way of growing a lot of vegetables in your home garden. It's real easy. You can do it organically. It's very mobile and um, an easy one for the new gardener. If you're just starting out or you have limited light space and you want to grow a few vegetables like the whole country is doing right now, then you're going to use something like the earth box. Now you can find these things mail order, but look around locally. I'd prefer to buy locally than sending stuff in, but if you're out there viewing in an area of uh, central Texas, well then, you, and you can't get it at a store, go ahead and order it online. It's called an earth box, and it's a very effective way to grow vegetables. For Backyard Basics, I'm John Dromgul. I'll see you next time. Visit klru.org slash ctg to watch online. Until next week, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online, and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org ctg.